Square Ball Podcast. Hello there. Welcome to the show. Dan here along with Michael and Phil Hay. If you're on the video version on YouTube, you will see Phil Hay is wearing a football shirt today. What football shirt is that, Phil Hay? Never before seen this, or not since I was about 25. It's um, Heart of Midlothian, and it was brought back by somebody at the club after the Hearts Leeds friendly, which I managed to miss with quite exceptional timing. We'll talk about all that in a second. First thing to mention is that the show is brought to you by West Yorkshire Electrical. This is exciting for you, Michael, isn't it? Chance to do a new sponsor read? It's my first time. I'm very good at them. I'm surprised you've managed to do this without me. Um, Specialists in all things electrical. West Yorkshire Electrical, as you know. I like this that they say this. If it's got wires, they work with it. (laughs) Good that. Um, They are the business that sponsored the Reavy Wilco and Bielsa Mural in Geisley, which I drive past all the time. Um, fully accredited range of services for your home and business, specialise in renewable technologies as well. What what are the things that you like that they do, Michael? Let, let's pick a number between two and four. Well, let's go for the truth, three. three yeah. big th- a big three. How do you want to sell them as? Uh, yeah, kind of a big... Yeah, a big three. A yeah. big three, I'd say. I'd, I'd go with actually all the um, sustainable stuff, really. Solar panel installation, they do that, which you can then link up to battery storage. They yeah. can link to solar panels, can't they? Yeah. And you can also charge a car off that. Can you? And then do those charging points too. Great stuff. Well done. Big three. Well executed. The, the big, big sustainable three. The big sustainable three. Um, yeah, excellent. Well done. I enjoyed the delivery of that. It's more polished than the stuff that you usually do. Uh, covering the whole well, of Yorkshire. As you've seen my electrical work, you know you know, I know what I'm doing with electrical <laughs> stuff. I, I'm, I'm actually glad we've got a link up with an electrical company because you do terrify me. Well. I, I'm just <laughs> awaiting one day with a message from your wife saying, Michael's in hospital because he's done something silly. Rather than calling in somebody professional to do it. Well, in the old podcast building, I always used to drive in every Thursday wondering if it had burned down yet. <laughs> but no. Yeah, do get you should get professionals really to do, uh, Absolutely. To do electrical work. As I said, fully accredited, cover the whole of Yorkshire and beyond. Um, finance available for work on your home or your business. I, just, I was actually just poking around on the website, Phil, and it's wyelectrical.co.uk um, for full details. And uh, West Yorkshire Electrical, have a look for them on socials. Loft conversions to do stuff you know, like related to your loft conversions, your lights and all that. And you... We've already got one. And so, yeah. oh, <laughs> funny you should yeah. mention that, yes. Phil. <laughs> Never mentioned it before. Yeah, uh, wyelectrical.co.uk for full details on that. And look out for the big three, which were, Michael, just one more time. They were electric vehicle charging, battery storage and solar panel installation. You switched on today. I love it. Right, so your heart shirt. So what we're going to have a chat about today is Phil Hay with Phil Hay because it's the international break. Um, the, the interview nobody wanted. Yeah, less an interview, just more of a chat because you you get to interview other people and we thought we'd have a chat to you about what made you the man you are. <laughs> it's in no way a rip-off of the Guardian's Life and Times Off series, which I mentioned the other day. I said, have you heard the Guardian do these ones? They're quite interesting sometimes. Which, and what was my answer to that? You said, uh, no, no, I haven't. I haven't. <laughs> then I said, well, let's, let's rip that off. Can't be a rip-off. Let's rip that off and we'll speak to Phil yeah. <laughs> What made me the man I am, overeating and too much alcohol, yeah. <laughs> Well, let's start there then in your upbringing in Scotland. <laughs> Which actually fits with this shirt because um, it, it's got number 23 on the back. So when I got it, I thought, oh, I'll have a look at the squad list and see who was wearing it for the, the friendly against Leeds. And the answer was nobody because there wasn't in, there wasn't a 23 in the heart squad. So I presume it must be uh, an academy player or must have been an academy player who was very thin. So there's a lot of breathing <laughs> in going on with this top. I put it on. My wife was just like... No. <laughs> Not again. I don't think so. <laughs> You've got a nice corset on as well, which is helping. Well, it's, yes. number, it's number 23. It's Snoddy's number anyway. That's so it. That's it, yeah. So you can always pass it off. And as, Calvin uh, Phillips. Yeah. As that. So, um, Heart of Midlothian, you were, you were born and raised in Edinburgh? I was born and raised in Pennycook, which is like a little commuter town. Right. Um, south of Edinburgh. Um, it's really difficult to quantify these things, but I always had the impression of Pennycook being a big hearts area, big hearts town. Um all of the all of the boys on the estate where I grew up, um, and that that makes me sound like I came from you know sort of um, rough or, or tough beginnings. We we did it has to be said have a pretty middle class upbringing, so it wasn't like I was growing up on the schemes of like Craig Miller or Mulehouse or anything like that. But the rather middle class estate where we grew up on, um, everybody there was a Hearts fan. I had the impression that that was about the only club that got supported um, round about where where we lived. Um, and it was kind of back in the day, and you'll remember this with Leeds as well, we didn't really have much awareness of other clubs elsewhere. Everything was in your local vicinity. I'm very much a, a child of the of the 80s. Um, and yeah, that was that was pretty much pretty much the start of it. And I would never say for me since, because it's been great following them, actually, yeah. despite the fact that they win next to nothing, and it's, um, it's quite often an ordeal. Um, but in terms of the Edinburgh split, it was the right choice. Yeah, definitely. Hmm? 
I don't know enough about it, to be honest with you. Just say that anyway. Yeah, yeah fine. Yeah. Did yeah. you have a big rivalry with, I'm just looking at the map now, with Bush, which is the next town over? Well, Bush was famous for Dolly the Sheep, you know. Oh, so, really? Yeah. Um, he died yesterday, actually, the um, doctor who created Dolly the Sheep. But yeah, it was up the road. There's not an awful lot in Bush, apart from this kind of medical research centre where they did produce Dolly the Sheep. So perhaps that's all it, all it really needed. Um, but no, like, Ed- Edinburgh's kind of strange like that. You've got commuter towns round about, um, I wouldn't say there's massive rivalries between any of the any of the towns, but you would never say to people, particularly especially down here, I never say to people, I grew up in Pennycook, um, because isn't, isn't the right lot to um to see or write home about in Pennycook. So you always you always felt that you were from from Edinburgh. It's a great city, Edinburgh. Um, but no, I was I was on the outskirts rather than in the centre. Presumably spent a lot of time in the Pentland Hills Regional Park and the uh, Rosslyn Glen Country have, Park have as a child. Claimed, have claimed several of uh, the of the Pentland Hills. Yes, yeah, and that's that's all I've got now. From looking at the map, Rosslyn Chapel, famous for uh, that book. Go on, uh, that book, Dan the Dan Brown book. Yeah, uh, one of the biggest the, selling books of all time. Yeah, not the Bible. That one, it's on Sky all the bloody time. Da Vinci Code? That's, that's the, the one. one, yeah. yeah. yeah it's the church it finishes. Yeah. Yeah. I did see a bit of that film once and I, I dismissed it as nonsense after about half an hour. I, I think, think it was, I yeah. Think put it on and I was like, this is awful, not yeah. watching this. Um, but anyway, so as as a child, growing up, um, what was your what was your era then when you first started getting into football? The first season I remember is 85, 86, which is proper grim season for Hearts. That close to being perfect. Um, should have won the league. Could have won the Scottish Cup. Didn't win either. Um, lost the league on the final day. Were beaten 3-0 in, in the final of the Scottish Cup by Aberdeen a week later. I think basically because they had nothing left at all. It's it's mentioned actually in um, Ferguson's autobiography. He talks about the fact that he... I don't know if you quite put it like this, but he felt a bit guilty about that result because Hearts had lost the league a week earlier. And, you know, it was like everything just falling apart in front of you but I was kind of too young really to properly take it in and to understand the the significance of it all I just remember that period being massively innocent when it came to football I, I don't have any you tell me if it's different with Leeds but I don't have any concept of finance back then you know like money and finance being a thing in football politics being a thing in football it was all just about the players and it was all just about the team and it was all just about the, the first experience of going into Tynecastle, because again, y- you had no perception of this because it was very rarely on the television. The only way, you, the only access you had to Hearts really day to day was through the back page of the Scotsman, which game was proper like middle class newspaper. But it's what we got delivered every day, so you read it in in the morning. And I sort of hope that these days, kids when they go into Ellen Road for the first time or go to Tynecastle or whatever else, have that same magical feeling and that it hasn't all been blown away by the fact that foot, football's so saturated and you see it everywhere and you you know you can watch games in any country any time you understand or you know things about players all over the world that that bit of the unknown and that bit of magic as you go in and think wow like this is what it's actually like you know you can see the grass you can see the stands you can see the nets and everything else um is still there because i remember that really clearly from the first game i went to and i would have been six i think um that it was just, it was just like tingling. I still get it now. There's, uh, I was talking to an American friend of mine who has, he says he's never been to a professional soccer match and he's waiting till the day that he can afford to come to Leeds and do it that way and experience Ellen Road properly for the first time. And I said to him, I'm kind of jealous of that. Mm-hmm. I'd love to go in with fresh eyes and not have my view coloured by like 40 years of, well, Leeds being Leeds. But I still do get it. I still get it when I walk under the, the, the stand and come out of the little um the gangway and then the green kind of because it you go from the stand and it gets dark under the little gangway but then you see the light kind of drawing you forward don't you and then you come out and you see the big expanse of green in front and it always looks so pristine especially with these new modern pitches and you still get that little just that little your heart just leaps it's the it's the total difference i think of seeing it in a kind of abstract sense so like on television or in photographs or anything else and then being there and being able to to feel and witness every aspect of it in um in Gorgie there was the North British um, distillery where they used to make loads and loads of whiskey and I think it's still there now and you used to get this really distinctive smell whenever you went down there and when I was young I always thought it smelled like sweet corn kind of weird but that's just what it what it was like and it was it's that thing if you understand that you couldn't be anywhere else you know if if you were there and you're smelling that you knew exactly where you were and for years, my dad was um, head teacher at Tynecastle High School, which was right next to the ground and, and still is. I think they've rebuilt part of it and moved away from the main building. But the main building was basically 
wall to wall with the stadium. So you had the school end um, at, at one side. And that was the same. Anytime you were there with him, you smelt the, you got that smell, you know, it was very much that, that was, was kind of goggy. And I still remember when I was young, you know, like the smell of people smoking cigarettes and lighting matches and all that, which you don't really get. Like these days you get vapes, do you not? And and even they're banned, I think. Yeah, not allowed. No fun. Just get occasional you know. whiff of like mango and passion fruit or something. Yeah, these that's days, it. So. That's it. Yeah. So, so not quite the same, but, um, I don't know. Like I, I loved how rough and ready it was because Ten Castle has been completely rebuilt and the, the main stand was finished a few years ago. For ages, that was like really decrepit to the point of being, you know, um, virtually condemned and a, a bit of a death trap. It, it, it always seemed when a you sat in it. A bit West Standy. Yes, uh, worse, worse. <laughs> um, I, I always got the feeling that if the, the main stand at Hearts was to catch fire, it wouldn't take long. Um but it, so it's totally rebuilt. But back then you had an open terrace for the away end. You had open terrace for the, the home end as well. You had what was called the shed that went round the side. And I don't know, like I, I that's one of the things I've always said this about Ellen Road that I really like is that it does still have a bit of an attachment to that kind of era. And I do think when it comes to football, your best days are always the, the days when you first get into it, the days when you're a, a kid. Because you get old and you get cynical, don't you? I think you get more cynical as well when you work as a football writer because you start to see the, and you start to write about and pay attention to the things in football that when you're six, seven years old, you just don't care about. In that area then, are you going with your dad to the games? No, my mum and dad were not into football and are still not into football, although my, my dad is as interested in it as he's ever been because of the fact that I'm writing about Leeds and he listens to our podcasts and various things. Not how much he understands of what's going on in it, <laughs> but um, but he does. But he does listen. So I used to go with friends and and their dad. They were were big Hearts fans as well. Um, the first game I went to was um, '87 in August. We played Dundee United, who at the time were really good, really good team. It was really good Hearts side that as well. But they'd um, gone very close in the, the UEFA Cup uh, and turned up at Ten Castle, got annihilated four one. Um, and again, it's that sort of thing where you think, this must be how it is every week. Like every <laughs> every week it's um every week it's perfect. Every week you win. Every week it's great. And also, like the the players used to stick around for ages, you know. So I love this winger called John Cahoon. He's always been my my favourite player. He's kind of like sex on legs. He came from Celtic, and he was like tricky winger in the traditions of the nineteen eighties. You remember what he was like? It it wasn't massively structured football back then and I always laugh when I watch the highlights because I don't think I had any real concept of how sort of kick and rush so much of it was I'm not saying like Scottish football has um, had a renaissance since then and is now you know the the, the peak of the peak of global football but it, it was it was kind of like that um but the players who you got attached to tended to be there for ages and I can remember John Robertson who was great striker for like top player for hearts great striker he used to score against Hibs all the time I remember him moving to Newcastle one summer. Um, it didn't work for him there, so he went down for one season and then and then came back. But I was thinking, I can't believe this is happening. Why is this happening? What's going on? Why why is he? He's not allowed to leave. Yeah, why 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 is he doing this? He's supposed to just play for for this club. And that's I, I try to remind myself of this stuff from time to time because, you know, like when Calvin Phillips is going to Man City, you're thinking, oh yeah, but they're the they are like the most successful club in the world at the moment. They've got the most money. It's obvious move. So of course it's going to happen. But um, at that age, you, you never really understood it. And it just wasn't like that where players would bounce around from club to club, would move for the money and, and this, that and the other. Um, and also, I mean, in the in the 1980s, the most exotic signing I can remember was a guy called Mike Galloway who came up from England. And even having an English player you're kind of like, this is interesting. <laughs> like, this is interesting. It was only in the 90s that we started signing players like Pascali Bruno and, and others that gave you a bit of proper um, exotic names and, and exotic faces. Um, but it was it was very, very Scottish. So hang on a second. If you were going in 1987, how old were you then? Uh, if you were just going with your mates? Six. We're just going with mates of parents or... Yeah, no, their yeah. dad took us. Yeah, no, they didn't <laughs> let us loose at the age of six and go just wander into the centre of Edinburgh go, and get the, get the bus. Um, but no, I'd have been I'd have been six at that point, yeah. And that's when that's when that squad were pretty much at the peak. So how how did you get into football in the absence of it in your household? Because for me, it was very much through my dad. You know, I just yeah, he started taking me to Ellen Road along with my mom. We, we all went when I was about maybe three or something like that, and I was just marauding around the back of the old Lowfield stand um, as a as a wee boy. And then uh, before you know it, you've just been going every week forever. And we used to, we used to do a lot of travelling up and down 
like during the 1980s, but it's just always been ingrained in me. I couldn't tell you what my first match was. I can't remember. That's uh, really interesting that because I can remember that um, Dundee United game really quickly, cause they, uh, really clearly because they scored right at the end. We used to, friend's dad used to take us out early, you know, like a couple of minutes before the end. And I, I can't remember now whether that was to beat the traffic or to beat any problems that would be um, outside the ground. But I remember them scoring at the end and us getting back to the car and him saying, oh, you know, talking about 4-0 win. And I was saying to him, oh, no, it's 4-1. Like, they, they stuck, stuck one in at the end. And I remember thinking at that point, that's why you should never really leave, isn't it? Because, like, game's, game's still going on. But I would have been about five and we were. Wa- I was watching... I can't remember who they're playing now, but they were playing on a midweek game, uh, midweek night, playing a game against somebody. And the following day, met up with all of my mates to walk to school. And do you remember back in the 80s, you used to get those sweatbands that had like hearts or hips or lids yeah, or whatever? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, he, I had them. He, yeah, that's it. So did I. Yeah, headbands. All yeah, that, yeah. You know, <laughs> unbelievably ridiculous stuff that you actually used to wear out. And your parents must be like, what, what are you doing? Um, and him saying to us, it was the oldest of the group, and him saying, you watched the game last night? I'm saying, yeah, who were you supporting? And I was so young, I was kind of like, I don't know really, I just sort of watching it. Pulled back his sleeve and he had this Hearts uh, sweatband on. He's like, well, that's who, who's I, I, who I'm into. And uh, that was just kind of it. And you're like, okay, that's interesting. So as time went on, you sort of took more and more note of the results and everything else. And then you were just itching to get to a game. Itching to get to a game. It's funny that a sweatband can just be the... The trigger, isn't it? Like my, yeah. one of my mates um, ended up as a Villa fan because I think he filled Villa first in his Panini sticker book growing up as a I kid. Know, that's, oh, yeah. I mean, the Panini sticker books were always the big thing. And needless to say, those were the things that you wanted first. You wanted the Hearts badge. There's always those silvery ones. The shiny. Yeah. The shiny ones, yeah. Um, and you wanted the team as well. You always had a team team picture as well. But the other thing was, like, he was a, he was older than us. So, you know, quite sort of influential at, at that age. But also... Nobody else seemed to support anybody. There was one oddball on our estate who followed Aberdeen. We were all a bit like... Mm. Yeah. But I didn't know anybody who supported Hibs at yeah. all when I was young, which is great. Did you get anyone supporting old firm teams? Not so much back then. I, I have a feeling if you went back to Pennycook now, you'd get a big number of um, Celtic and Rangers shirts. And actually, by the time I was leaving, when I was 17, if you went to the pub... Because back then, not that many people had Sky and so on. So if the old film Derby was on, you would go to go to the <coughs> pub to watch it and you would have a lot of Rangers and Celtic fans at that point. And it, it's only kind of increased because they do have much, much bigger bigger fan bases. But I think it was of its time in the 80s that because it was so local and Edinburgh was your local city and Hearts were one of your, your clubs, you were, you were far more drawn to that. Which isn't to say that nobody supported Celtic or Rangers, but there were certainly not so many of them. Was anyone bothered about English football at this time? No. No, I wasn't even really aware that English football existed until the start of the 90s and particularly Sky. And the interesting thing about Leeds, given how much I've written about them and and covered them, is that I knew next to nothing about Leeds when I was early teens, apart from... And nothing much has changed. No, it's still (laughs) the same, yeah, boom! (laughs) Um, Apart from that they'd beaten... Manchester United to the title in 92 because that got a lot of coverage in the Scottish press and the reason that it did was because the narrative was all about is Ferguson going to win his first title um, in England to which the answer was no he's not or not that year anyway so that that got covered right the way through the, the running and it was looking like Manchester United would win the title and then it all slipped away and there was a, there was a lot written about that but the other thing and the much bigger thing with Leeds was the Yeboah volley against Liverpool because like the Premier League had become white hot. That was 95, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Come white hot at that point. And the TV coverage was expanding. There was loads of money going into it. And I think I'm right in saying it was a Monday night game, yep. the, yeah. the Leeds-Liverpool game, um, which I can't remember how I saw that because we never had Sky in the house. Um, but the next day when you went to school, nobody knew who the hell your boy was. Never heard of him. A lot of people at, at, in school didn't really know anything about Leeds United either. Everybody was saying... You see that last night? It's the best goal you'd seen ever, really. Trying to recreate it. Yeah, absolutely. So you're out in the playground trying to do that. So Yeboah was somebody who, whenever anybody mentioned Leeds ever, when I was younger, you always thought, ah, oh, that's him. Yeah, yeah, it's funny how those like those things kind of transcend clubs and shirts and, and rivalries and stuff. Because I know that the way kids consume football now, um, we've looked at some of the research in this, haven't we? We've read about it, that kids get attached to it. And you see it like, you know, with, with um, all the arguments online about 
Messi and Ronaldo. Mm-hmm. They consume it through the prism of, of superstars now rather than teams um, like in the way that you say you, you organically got attached to hearts. Now mm-hmm. they, they play FIFA. They look at the play with the best stats or whatever and best skills and then they get attached to like Mbappe and stuff like that. It's, yeah. it's, it's fascinating, but it actually always existed, didn't it? Just in a, in a different way. It was just consumed in a different way because when you see something as iconic as that, that volley, yeah. it was it was exactly the same. Everybody wanted to copy it. I mean, I, that happened when I was about 16, 17, so I would have been a bit too old to kind of get consumed in the schoolyard in the same way. But um, even still, it's just etched it's etched in the memory. Yeah, I think Gascoigne is a good example of that as well. He was a, the first sort of journalistic piece I did, like really rudimentary, was at school, and it was about Gascoigne going to Rangers. Um, and it was a bit kind of... I, I didn't keep it, so I couldn't read it back now, but it was, as I recall, it was a bit pompous. It was about how... They'd spent a lot of money on him. Gaza had these things about him, didn't he, that were kind of problematic. He'd come with this bleached hair. Um, my English teacher was like, why didn't you write? I'd written this really boring, discursive essay about should boxing be banned? And he just kind of said, I can't, it's pages long. He's like, I can't be bothered to read this. Why don't you just do like <laughs> fi- 500 books Insp- on? Inspiring the next yeah, generation. That's it. Like, yeah, yeah, your stuff's rubbish. And then, then again, you see, nothing, <laughs> nothing's altered. But, um, why don't you do 500 words on is Gaza moving to Rangers for this amount of money a good thing? And I can't really remember um, what what I said in the end. Um, I think it was the idea of would football be better if it was amateur than professional? And at that point, you were kind of like, well, no, because professional football is really good. But then you get to the point that football is now and it's just like money money on steroids and it, it seems to have gone, gone wildly off piste. But Gascoigne and Brian Loudrup at Rangers were... It was like the Messi effect, the Ronaldo effect, in that they could win games on their own. If you ever get the chance, have a watch of Gascoigne against Aberdeen. Rangers won the title that day. It must have been 95, 96. He scored a hat-trick. Um, and they were 1-0 down Rangers. Um, the, the, two, the first two goals he scores are absolutely brilliant, especially the second one. And I always remember reading an um, interview with, with one of the Rangers players after, I can't remember who, and he said that one all, we were all knackered. And I basically said to, to Gascoigne, look, Gazza, we just need a bit of magic from you. Just need you to do something because nobody else is going to do it. And Gazza goes from about 20 yards in his own half to the Aberdeen box, scores in the way that he does, dribbling past about eight or nine players. Um, and so I don't think these days you guys like Mbappe and Messi and Ronaldo are more natural. Well, it's probably not true in um, Messi and Ronaldo. Maybe not true in Mbappe either, but... I don't think you say they're more naturally skillful than Gaza. They just look after themselves far better and they're in an era where it's easier to make more of yourself. And obviously Gaza had, had issues as well. But I think back then you would have been as attached to that sort of player. It's just that once they leave your club, they're gone, aren't they? So you remember them for what they've done and you and you respect them and rate them for what you, you, you've done. But nobody from Rangers was going to go off and follow Burnley because Gaza was going down to Burnley. You know, no. It's just not how... No, it is, especially in that city. That Rangers team in the mid-90s was the first, it was the first real glimpse of Scottish football I had as well because they'd, they'd obviously beaten Leeds that I'd remembered. I kind of got into Leeds the year after that, more than more than that year, but I, ve- I remember that happening. And then they just had a good side because I remember Gaza going there and they still had like Loudrup and Andy Gorman and Ali McCoyston. And... When, when you think about it, do you think about the Adidas kits? Yeah. Yeah, that's mm. the first thing in my head. Yeah, yeah. And, and that Scottish team at the time as well, I kind of knew them because of Euro '96 and because of Gary McAllister playing, yeah, playing for them. So I feel like that was the first time Scottish football really came on my radar. And truthfully, it's disappeared at some point when Rangers uh, went, yeah. when, when Rangers <laughs> lost those players. <laughs> but I mean, Gordon is still the best keeper I've ever seen in the flesh. He was he was phenomenally good. Um, and actually, I mean that like, again, that's probably not true because I'll have seen better keepers since. But he's the best. He's to my mind the best keeper I've ever watched, just because some of some of what he did, especially because he was he was so short. I mean, he's no longer with us, Gordon. Um, but he he used to he used to drink at he used to live up the road from me. He used to drink at the golf club um, round the corner, and he was a he was a crazy character. I mean, again, there were kind of there seemed to be skeletons in in his closet. Um, but I interviewed him once, and he told me that just randomly at a PFA golf day, I used to write a bit for the PFA's magazine. And he was telling me, you remember he went down, I think he was at Motherwell at the time, and Man United needed a goalkeeper. Um, so they signed Gorham, and, and Gorham was well past his best by this stage, but they just desperately needed somebody who was going to play a couple of a couple of games. So he said he got this phone call one day. I phone went and picked it up. He said, uh, it's Alex Ferguson. Um, just 
I really need you to come down because we've got problems, you know, just hoping that, that you might be able to give us a month, couple of months, um, leave Motherwell for a bit and, and help us out. Gorham said he stood and he listened to this. And at the end, it went silent at the end of the phone. And he just said, fuck off, Coisty. <laughs> and there was this long, long silence. And he said, slowly, the penny started to drop. And Ferguson just says to him, Andy, you still there? <laughs> and he said afterwards, because him and McCoy used to wind each other all, up all the time. And some of the stories about McCoy and Gascoigne um, are, are pretty legendary as well. Um, but he said, when I came off the phone, I was having like palpitations because I was thinking just about the biggest move I'm ever going to get. I've very nearly blown because I've just sworn at Ferguson down the phone. And, and, and mistaking him for um, for Ali McCoy's. But that squad was amazing. The thing about Rangers was they, they got better from there because they got into the era where they signed De Boer, the, the De Boer twins. Um, they had Arteta up there, Barry Ferguson and so on. Obviously, there's much bigger history there because of what was going on financially and, and what it led to. Um, but it's funny because that probably was a team that would have made people in England kind of aware of Scottish football in the way that these days it just doesn't happen like that, does it? Did you want to play as a kid? Did you ever like knock around in the schoolyard? Did you play at the school team? How did we, we played, but I was never any good. So I was actually half decent at rugby when I was young. So I played briefly for Midlothian and, and for Edinburgh schools. And the, the, that was great. But the downside of it was that that meant that it took up your weekends. So uh, through my secondary school years, I didn't get to see Hearts anywhere near as much as I would have liked to have done, which had consequences like in 98 when they got to the Scottish Cup final, I couldn't get a ticket for it. Um, because Hearts hadn't won the Scottish Cup for, for 40 years by that point and everybody wanted to go. So, you know, then there was there was no chance of doing it. And it's it's not a regret and it's not a downside because this job's been great and covering Leeds has been great, but it is incredibly difficult to marry up being at Leeds games every weekend and particularly in the Championship with midweekers and everything else, plus the, the kids. Uh, marry that up with ever getting to see Hearts. I haven't been to see Hearts in the flesh now for about three years, so it is it is long overdue. Um, but it is really difficult. But I had I had very little talent as a player. No, absolutely not. I I know some people think they're they're either going to be a footballer if they're not good enough, or they're going to be a footballer because they probably are good enough. But I, it was pretty obvious to me right from the start that it was going to be neither. If you had to liken your playing style to a Leeds player, <laughs> what would you go for? Tony Capaldi um, or someone? I, th- I think when I was young, I think I was a bit Berardi. I used to play right back yeah. um, and a bit rash. I played right back for reckless. a bit. Yeah, because I was only I was I only small. Right I was small as a child, so they, I think they naturally because when the big lads would go through the middle, wouldn't they? All the shit players play right back. I was a right back too. <laughs> <laughs> it was with, a, with a great right back at Hearts, guy called Walter Kidd, who went by the name is nickname of Zico, um, and I, I I loved that. Yeah, I thought it was I thought it was a great position. Yeah. You could hide a bit there as well, not hide in a physical sense, but. You don't have to be that talented. It you was know. near a fullback stopping on the halfway line as well for, yeah. a, for a lot of the time. That's yeah. what that's, there was, there was that's no, the way I used to there play. Was no Jed Spence in it up <laughs> and down. It, that's <laughs> it. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't in the days of wing backs particularly. Gave it to the winger and said, you know, you we'll beyond halfway, I've, you do it. I was proud of my growth spurt. I started moving forward through the team. I ended up like playing up front for a bit, like when I was in, in the sixth form. And I had um, one particular stellar year, which was great fun. Actually, scoring goals. Mm-hmm. That, was, that was a lot of fun. But I do remember being. I was. I was. I was all right at right back. I think not too bad. But I, never, never a particularly good player. I, I would say, without pretending that it's easier to be a professional rugby player than a footballer, because it's definitely not. I think it's easier to get to a certain level as a rugby player because a lot of it is about just developing. It's, you can develop a lot of the technique without needing to have it really naturally. Whereas I always felt with football, it's either in your feet or it's not. And if it isn't, then there's nowhere to go, is there? And obviously for rugby, you're an absolute tank of a man. So you were perfectly built see, for it. I was from I was from that era where I used to play outside centre or winger because back then, you used to, if you were skinny or fairly small, stick you out there. You know, whereas these days, you've got to be about seven foot to play on the wing. So if you, did, if you weren't playing, how did the... How did the football kind of attach itself to you? And so when you go from the, the, the school years, when you go in with like your, your mate's dad or whatever. Oh, I did. I did used to play. Yeah. I just was never any good, yeah. you know, not to stand it. But that's the glorious thing about school is it's, you know, to a degree, the taking part that counts. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Know, to a certain level, then people start getting pissed off you because you're not good enough. So through, like, through your teenage years, as you started to become like a young man when you're sort of mm. 16, 17 and breaking away from like the schoolyard. How, how did you make that step and why did, why did Hearts stick and... 
how did you consume it? Did you still go to games at that point? Yeah, as often as, as I could. But as I say, other things kind of got in the way more than I would have liked. And that's been true through my adult life as well. But I, I've, I've been lucky really with Hearts that they've had three great teams. So they had 85, 86, so just a little before my time. But I can remember that season just and I can remember a lot of what came after so I saw a lot of those players playing and saw how good they were and then there was 97-98 where they were a little bit unlucky not to win the league but did win the Scottish Cup um, it was a team that they kind of couldn't really afford in the long term which was also true of 05-06 um, I wrote recently about 05-06 somebody one of our subscribers at The Athletic wanted a big read on Romanov which was great fun because he's living in a submarine in Russia at the moment <laughs> hiding out from the Lithuanian authorities or at least I think he is he, he was wanted for extradition over various fraud um, matters but nobody in Lithuania would actually reply to say I did ask the prosecutor's office but nobody would reply to say yes he's still wanted yes these charges are outstanding or no we've just let him go but one way or the other he is in this village um, it, somewhere in Russia he, he bought this submarine and it's now refurbed and he just kind of kind of lives in it but the players they signed were ludicrously good for Hearts, like way better than anything else they'd had previously. And they had George Burley for a time. I was speaking to Stephen Presley, who was the old um, Hearts captain, um, about the, the sacking. Most, the most obvious nickname in football ever, by the way. Yes. Yeah, go on. Can you guess? <laughs> Priscilla? <laughs> That's the one. That's yeah. the one. Would have been a different story, that, wouldn't it? Um, and he said, you know, because Burley obviously got sacked very early on and, and it was part of all the politics that developed. But Presley says he remembers being told that Bully had been sacked in Ricketon, the training ground, and he was looking at the shelf next to him and there were two or three Manager of the Month awards there because Hart's been so good through that spell. Top of the league um, had, well, unbeaten, I think, at the point where Bully got sacked, that um, that's what had happened. He'd, he'd picked up every award. Um, so that was a great team as well. They won the Cup in 05, 06, um, but then also had the joy of 2012, which was a weird experience actually beating Hibs in the final because you came away from that thinking, I'm 30, 31 and I'll never see a better game than that. Bigger game, more important game. Did you just know? That. You knew yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah, it's never going to, even if Hearts were to win the league. That, that awareness, yeah. isn't it? But I guess it comes with age a little bit. Yeah, I just think if Hearts were to win the league or the Champions League, or which never happened, but um, it would never, you never have the tension that there was before that game. No, and it's the biggest derby by miles, and you just had to win it. Yeah. Had to win it. And it was a proper doing. What are um this is gonna sound like a strange question. What are Hibs fans like? Because I feel like <laughs> I feel like if I asked Dan, like, what's wrong with Man United fans, you'd be mm. able to give me a fairly comprehensive answer. Probably, yeah. What's wrong with Hibs fans? I'm not friends with any, so I couldn't tell you. <laughs> no, that's um that's not true. Um this is the weird thing, isn't it? Once you get away from once you get away from football, perfectly nice people. But I can't, for the life of me, understand what the appeal is of following that club at all. <laughs> I just don't, just don't see it. Don't see it. And, and it's not as if there haven't been periods where where they've been better than Hearts and have beaten Hearts. But I think if I went through my record from, let's say, the start of 85 onwards or 86 onwards, I think the number of wins over Hibs would vastly outweigh the number of defeats to them. It's a pretty clear... Clear waiting in the rivalry, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> no. It's one of those nice things. That you, it's just a proper, it's a dick swingy thing, isn't it? Like yeah. so if you're, if you're in, a, in a room with, with Hibs fans. Yeah, like, yeah, well, it's absolutely but, pathetic. Yeah, the way yeah. you get it you'd be like, away, well, yeah. beat you again later this season then, shall we? Yeah, that mm. kind of thing. But yeah. So how old were you then? So the 97, 98 nearly team, how old were you then? 17. So you're 17. So that, I mean, what a time that is as well when you're 17 yeah. and you've got a brilliant football team to support. Oh, we got, we got absolutely leathered at friends of mine for the <laughs> final because it was back in the days where... Um, supermarkets didn't really bother ID and anybody, so we just w- waded in before kickoff. Um, it was, it was, it was brilliant that. And, and as I say, I had already by that point reached the stage of thinking that Hearts would never win anything. That they go close and it would be, it would be kind of there for the taking, and then it it wouldn't happen. Like the, <coughs> one of the games that always sticks in my head is I think it was eighty nine. They lost to. Um, lost Celtic in the semi-final, the Scottish Cup. And it was probably the first time, apart from 86 when I was really young, when I thought they were going to do it. And they won the up against Celtic. And then Henry Smith of Leeds United fame, as people obviously remember, and which I had not, again didn't realise until about 10 years ago, um, it didn't quite throw in two goals in the last two or three minutes, but managed to concede two really soft goals in the last two or three minutes. And that was really hard to take. And that was the sort of game where Gaia Sauce lose to Airdrie. 
that point where you thought this you can't lose this game. You know, this would be completely winnable. And the the even news was published either the day after the Scottish Cup final or the um the the Monday. And there's a great line at the start of it which said, you know, Saturday was the day when God reached down and touched everybody who had the misfortune to follow hearts and said, this one's for you. And that was kind of how it felt. You know, like finally there was actually something that had been worth going for and, and something in, in return for it all. So it was it was absolutely amazing. A lot of people will say it was bigger for them 98 than 2012 because it was, you know, particularly older fans who've been waiting for years and years and years. Um, but for me, 2012 outdoes that yeah. comfortably. So what were you doing at that time in your life then when you're 17? Are you still at sixth form, college? I was finishing school and I was, about, I was about two or three months from heading down to Sheffield to start university. Because we used to do exams. I don't know if this is still the case. We used to do exams a year before they were done in, um, in England. So when I came down to Sheffield, I was the only underage drinker in the entire halls of residence because everybody else was English. But give or take. And everybody was like 18, 19, 20. I was really, really young. <coughs> uh, so yeah, we'd, we would have virtually finished school by that point. And also because we did our major exams in our fifth year rather than our final year, we'd just been tossing it off all year. You already had your grades and you already knew where you were going and which university you were you were likely to, to head to. So yeah. What a weird setup. A dr- lot of drinking. Oh, fantastic though, yeah, because... I, I can't got, get my head around it. I got an unconditional offer from Sheffield in... October of my final year, which left a lot of open space in which there was no real need to do anything at what all. What a setup. <laughs> although I just blew my mind that that's the thing. Yeah. I, feel like, I this, feel like more of life should be set up like this. This is another <laughs> another mystery of my life, but I was a head boy at our school in our final year, so I did have to try you and set some... You little fucking squat. I know, I did have to set <laughs> some, you little some, Frank form of, some form of example. <laughs> like, yeah. it, were you the most sober one there then at, at that point, probably? It wasn't, the, was, it wasn't the school your dad was head of, was it? No. Um, he, he, he didn't make you head he boy. He did actually. He was assistant... <laughs> um, assistant assistant head at Pennycook High where I went and then it was just suggested to him by my mum when we were really young we'd moved through there um, and it was suggested to him that if he was at the school we probably wouldn't enjoy going to that school very much so how's about you move 10 miles north and go to Edinburgh which he did yeah oh, oh, good, good move good move I do not envy people who have parents as teachers it's funny that, isn't it so you were, you were sort of cast on this path at it, like 17 basically, to, mm-hmm. to get into the journalism. Is that something you knew you always just wanted to do? What, what was it? That no, kinda... it was it was a mate of mine. I was really trying to decide what to do at university. I didn't have much idea, really. Um, and he said, I think I might do journalism. And I thought, sounds like quite good fun, that. And especially when you thought about it more and you realised that people got paid to write about <coughs> football and stuff like that. It seemed like a, a pretty good idea. Um, and the advantage was that back then it was quite a... It's not. It's not a booming industry now, but you, do you know what I mean? It was booming in the sense that there were quite a few avenues into it. If you want, if you were qualified, or if you'd, you'd gone through university or whatever else, and even if you won, I mean, I grew up on a street with a guy called Mark Donaldson, who will say himself didn't do very well on his exams. I think he left school when he was sixteen, seventeen. He went to Fourth FM, which was local station in Edinburgh, and basic massive Hearts fan. Basically said, um, "I'll make the tea, but I want to start doing, you know." start covering hearts so that usual thing of well you know you can make the tea and let's see what happens and little by little started going to the old press conference then there were opportunities to cover this and that which he would do was really naturally talented at it um and now he's in america working for espn he does the golf coverage and all that sort of stuff so he's all he's all over the places as mark um so you you could get into it that way whereas these way these days it's far more Far yeah. more difficult. Exactly the same um, parallels with, with talk, talking about Ray. I used to work for the same company that oh, now owned Fourth. Yeah. Bauer. Um, and it was the same sort of deal. But I came into it too late, like into radio. I got into it late when all the just all the jobs started to go. That's it. All these like, like you might be doing the mid morning show and getting 70 grand a year on a staff contract or, yeah. and things like that. And then, then you knew you could come in as the T boy and work your way up because there were always job opportunities in front of you. And now they've all just all gone. Yeah. Every, everything's kinda, completely gone. It's kind of tricky because I, I do from time to time. Um, seminars or lectures or whatever tutorials at um, Leeds Trinity where they have a really really good sports journalism um, degree um, which is well worth doing but you do find yourself thinking from time to time God I hope you're all able to get jobs you know I hope there is enough in the industry to, to accommodate everybody and it was a bit simpler back then 
Like my in my head, I always thought I'd really like to work for a big local paper, which the the Evening Post was and still is, but obviously it's a completely different form now. The, the paper barely barely sort of exists as a, as an entity, um, and also cover a big club, which of course Leeds United were. And at the time when I went there, they were in the Championship, but they were just you could tell it's massively newsy and massively massively interesting. But I think it was a bit easier to kind of move two hundred fifty miles south. Think to yourself, I'm going to write about football. Um, and actually feel that it might it might happen. I don't know how it is for um, students these days. I mean, they tell me might tell me differently, but it seems like a tough market. AI churning out transfer stories. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's basically all that's required. <laughs> but, but but don't you think it's interesting? Like from all our points of view, is that you you now work for a thing that didn't exist when you were a kid. Yeah, and we've done a thing that didn't exist mm-hmm. here. Yeah, when we were kids, there was not there was no YouTube, there was no podcast. You know. Um, platform. If someone had asked me to describe what I wanted to do, this would have been it. Yeah, yeah. But someone would also have gone, <laughs> "Well, don't be stupid. You can't talk about. You can't to talk about Leeds every single day of the week." Yeah, yeah. yeah. No one's going to listen to it, and and what is it even going to be? It's not going to be on telly, is it? But that's yeah. it. It sounds futuristic, doesn't it? Yeah. God, I just can't can't see how that's ever ever going to happen. Um, but it has changed wildly. Um, and I mean, even even when I first joined the Evening Post, it was shifting. Two thousand four. It was shifting probably. 70, 80,000 copies a day. So it was still a, you know, the, the actual paper copy that was is still a big... That is wild f- when you consider the figures now. Massive feature. Not of the white pages of any, any yeah. print media. Yeah, any print media. Absolutely. But party thinks um, the city's got, what, population of six, 700,000? Yeah. That'd be about right. You think it should be able to carry um, those type of sales figures. Uh, but these days, nobody particularly wants a paper like paper form paper I think it's different with like the square ball and you know like the summer specials that, that you guys do because it's it, it's almost like periodical um, so it's like interesting features and I think to, to a degree certainly when we started out with the athletic that was kind of the plan of attack was to do different things which are readable no matter what's going on round about we definitely swerved more towards transfer stuff and you know like day to day news and, and developments and so on but like your summer special had the McCormack piece in it, which is just a great read. And it's a great read whether you read it this summer or read it, you know, if it sits about in your house for six months and you read it at Christmas, uh, it just is is what it is. And it, it's very, very saleable, I would say. Whereas the kind of immediacy of newspapers just seems to have gone. So it was almost an accident then, journalism. You just thought, oh, that sounds all right, I'll give that a whirl. Well, it, it, it wasn't, it wasn't. I mean, I did actually apply to do journalism um, at Sheffield. So that was the course that I did. Uh, but it wasn't, there were sports journalism modules in it, um, and I did casual work at the Press Association, the sports desk over there as well, while I was, I was at university. Paid amazing money, you know, absolutely unreal. When, like, when you're a student as well? Considering we were completely talentless and, yeah. you know, totally untrained and everything else. Um, you used to get paid monthly, and you'd just sit and go, I can't believe how much money I've... Like, why are they, why are they paying us this cash? It was absolutely great. But it was spread across a, a lot of... Um, a lot of areas, of course. So we did Crown Court reporting and Magistrates Court reporting and Council reporting, none of which particularly floated my boat. But Council reporting. Stuff. Oh. I know, but it's quite important. It is, isn't, but, but isn't it? It, it, is. it doesn't there's, get a pulse racing like, you know, a last minute winner at Ellen Road, does it? There's a girl called Jen who worked on the um, Manchester Evening News and I think has now moved to the Financial Times and her surname escapes me, which it shouldn't do. But she did great reporting of Manchester Council's machinations. And I always love in private eye, you know, the Rotten Boroughs page. Absolutely brilliant to see, well, not brilliant, but amazing to see some of what goes on behind the scenes. So while it seems really dry and while it seems really boring, actually... Maybe that's why the scandal exists. A lot, yeah. ah, a lot of it's... And partly because people think it's really boring and people think it's really dull. So nobody looks closely, you know, nobody Jackie really Weaver sees what's going... Yeah, brought it to, brought it to the that's, fore. That's it, you see. Um, and I suppose... To an extent, maybe football clubs were like that as well. Until people started to really look behind the scenes at what was going on, a, a lot of stuff happened because nobody paid an awful lot of attention to it. But I do miss the, and I always have missed the kind of innocence of first spot in hearts when all you really cared about was the games. And you never, you, you didn't really think that much about the bigger picture either. You know, you could see and enjoy games in isolation we've spoken quite a bit about this recently and this is definitely true of Scottish football now that you do have to kind of enjoy it or love it for what it is because if you're looking for more it's just never never going to be there you know? yeah, it's funny interesting isn't it to see English football as kind of mirrored what happened in Scotland which was always like you know, it was Rangers or Celtic that's how I consumed Scottish football mm-hmm. it was one of the two 
and then there were some cup competitions around the periphery and you know, but but as a kid, you kind of you don't think, oh well, the Hearts fans are going to be happy at winning a Scottish Cup every ten years or whatever, mm. or fifteen years. It's just it's just now you think of it is it you get you gravitate towards the biggest the biggest of the prizes. Um, but I, English football, I think, is is now going that way. Mm-hmm. It's turning into that kind of if you look at what Man City are at the minute, it's just it's untouchable, isn't it? And that's why I've kind of I've tried to reach a bit of a, a point of peace with the Premier League in that it was horrible to fall out of it, but I've not missed a single thing about it, you know. I know we can't be in the EFL and we have to be in the Premier League because the alternative's worse. And eventually if we stay here for too long, financial, not ruin awaits, but a financial reset awaits that won't be much fun. It'll be a bit of a grind. Yeah. But there's something, I don't know, there is something about the EFL that speaks to that part of I, I of, totally of agree. I, I, worry about, I worry about Leeds, not because they don't have a huge fan base and not because they aren't... A, terrific club with a massive profile but because I've kind of seen in Scotland the way in which you can get isolated um, or kind of pinned in your own patch when the money elsewhere and the profile elsewhere becomes physically impossible to compete with Um, and I think that's the risk of Saudi Premier League on top of like Man City and, and other clubs of that amount of money is how do you stay part of the conversation how do you kind of stay relevant to all of that when it's moving away from you at such a rate and it's not anybody's fault really that it's moving away or at least it's not your fault that it's moving away at that rate it's just incredibly difficult to keep up with it um and i suppose if that's the way things are going and it has gone that way in scotland um so you have to just try and find the love in a one nil defeat at dundee you know <laughs> which not always not always easy but i i must have said previously you know there was a uh, there was always a lot of argument online about Robbie Nielsen, who was the last Hearts manager before Naismith, who's there now, um, or at least before this kind of incumbent, weird coaching setup that Hearts seem to have at the moment. And there's quite a lot of clamour for Nielsen to go because the attitude was, we can't get to the next level with Nielsen. And my attitude was always, I know it's a bit defeatist, but there is no next level. Like, this is it. This is this is how it's going to be. This is it's how it's going like that. It's, that, um, it's the speech... Um in train spotting when they're out in the in the wilderness yeah like like we're yeah. scottish it's shame ex- ex- except oh, <laughs> i i can kind of make peace with that yeah. and just accept that actually it hasn't been that much different it's just that if you go back 20 years you had more of a feeling that you could actually catch the old film and the only way in which hearts almost did post 86 apart from 98 where they, they did go fairly close but the burly season where they might have have done it was by spending money that they couldn't really afford and that ended with them in, in administration further down down the line that's kind of those are kind of your options um and i guess if you see it like that and it's definitely not like that at hips at, at, hips at leeds leeds have vast scope for expansion still but i still think that some of what's going on financially just seems like wildly off the scale and yeah. can can even a club as big as leeds ever bridge the gap to the type of money that you're talking about when you've got state funding basically well, i was going to say the other side to that is if you look at newcastle two or three years ago to where they are now it's yeah. possible but the things you have to do the things you have to engage in yes the moral dance you have to do as a fan it feels like that if that's the alternative way out of it i'm I maybe in the minority here but i'm I'm fine not having that yeah i i kind of feel feel like that and, the, and part of the reason i feel like that is because if i go back to when i first started following hearts which definitely like the happiest time of following them um I, I didn't particularly need any of that then. Um, I don't really see why I need any of it. Now, it would be nice for Scottish football to be more competitive, but it isn't ever going to be. And part of the reason for that, you have to be honest about this, is that Glasgow carries football in, in a way that Edinburgh just doesn't. There must be far more scope in Edinburgh to attract much bigger crowds to, to Hearts and Hibs because it's got a big, big population. But if you think about Rangers and Celtic, and there's far more going on with Rangers and Celtic, there's a lot of politics there, um, and and everything else but they have tens of thousands of season ticket holders both of them um i don't know how many exactly but let's say for the sake of argument 20 30 40 thousand at, at both but certainly the the potential to sell that if you're able to they might have um season ticket caps but they could quite easily do that and that's in a city where in surrounding areas you've got st mirren and you've got hamilton and you've got motherwell and you've got party thistle plus you know smaller clubs again like clyde and greenock at Morton like Glasgow carries a huge amount of what you would call of either professional football or you know in in the middle um in a way that that Edinburgh 
just kind of doesn't, or not to the same degree. So it stands to reason that Rangers and Celtic are going to be much more powerful, and they definitely are. So when you were, you know, you were at college, yeah, and you're doing all the different modules and stuff. Did you kind of just get get drawn towards football as a bit of a honeypot subject because it's oh, yeah. it's fun and you yeah. you liked it growing up? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. no, massively. Um, it just seemed like a great career if you could do it. Yeah, I, mean, I say to people all the time, the thing about this job is it's not. It's not really consequential. You know, It football matters to people. And there's some some things that go on in football that are really serious and, and do it is important that people shine a light on it. But the, the general day-to-day thing of football clubs playing football games and winning or losing... I mean, I said, when I, when I went away for um, my operation, I did a piece before I went, and as part of it, I was talking about a guy who used to work at the Evening Post, um, Charles Hesley, who I think is still at BBC Leeds now. He basically used to walk past us and say... Um, the team plays team. They team either win, play, lose. Yeah. They either win, lose, or draw. Exclusive. I know. <laughs> it, it's just the needless all the time with that. But that you know that was yeah. kind of, when it came came to the games. And I know there's so much more nuance in it. But that was kind of it. I know, you know? Charles as well. That's yeah, great. You yeah, got a very dry sense exactly, of humour. Yeah. Exactly like that. So we used to constantly just tell him to fuck off. But like yeah. you know that was his joke all the all the time. Um. So it. it it has been the ability to do something that people do get very, very, you know, engaged in and irate about and angry about or passionate about. Um, but in the grand scheme, there's so many more important things, so many more consequential things, which has been nice, really. While we're still on the young Phil Hay, I feel I need to ask, because a lot of people were shocked by this. I received a, a WhatsApp from a friend of the podcast, Hollywood director Max Winkler, oh. one time that said, my God, Phil's tattoo. <laughs> he was shocked. He was shocked that you had a tattoo, Phil. I was on, when, I was, was, only, when was that? What brought it about? I was only nineteen. We, um, I was working at Dixon's during the summer. There was a lot of drinking in that summer. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't believe. You wouldn't believe it. You wouldn't believe it. I, 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 um, I went home after first year at, at university and was thinking. I don't know if it's still the same now. You used to get like three months off, three, four months off. You know, like yeah. a long, long summer. <clears throat> so I was thinking, I'll sit around for six weeks. My mum said to me, right, tomorrow, stick a shirt and tie on, go into Edinburgh, get yourself a job. I was like, oh, right. So I went on to Princess Street, just went in and out of places, getting application forms. And I applied to Dixon's, got a job there um, really quickly because they were always looking for summer work. And I was thinking to myself, you know... This electrical it, manufacturer, by the way, for anybody who doesn't yeah, know sorry, Dixon's. Yeah, it doesn't like really a, exist anymore. It's like Curry's PC yeah, World yeah, style thing. In a, yeah, in the United States, like Tandy or something yeah, like that. Was yeah, it was famous yeah. once, no yeah. longer exists, um, like a lot of things. Um, so I was thinking, probably be quite a square crowd in here, you know, like people who are into cameras and, yeah. you know, Tape hi- hi-fis and, yeah, and all yeah. that sort of stuff. Um, and they were complete lunatics all of them <laughs> just um, animals and the worst night we ever had was we used to uh, from time to time after work drink in the basement that they had um, and the worst night we ever had was when this lad Andy um, got a huge big bowl and he mixed milk with Buckfast a couple of pints of milk or like about six pints of milk with a couple of bottles of Buckfast and it sort of tasted a little bit like chocolate milk um, but it was incredibly incendiary um, and I, yeah, so it was, it was, du- it was during that summer that I ended up with the tattoo, but it was different back then because people tended to get one or two and they were expensive as well. You know, so it wasn't like, I, I'm not saying they're cheap now, um, but my observation is that people seem to be far more able to afford them now or far more willing to put money that way. And also the, the fashion of the day is that you get covered in them, you know, yeah. as opposed to just the, the odd one. Um, which is you've got the, the Pamela Anderson barbed wire that's right, yeah, under, stamp, haven't you? under this skin tight t-shirt <laughs> yeah <laughs> trying to hold it in <laughs> trying to breathe that's so funny that, that you expected Dixons to be all boring and they're just well, I thought, it might, I thought it might be yeah no they, they completely were yeah they completely were. <laughs> something of a shock mind you you had all that sweet PA money didn't you to, uh, to blow on your tattoos and your uh, not by your that party point no there. no not by that point but yeah. um, it was the following year but um, Dixons did pay pretty well as well, we used to get bonuses. I mean, this is terrible, right? You used to sell insurance packages, um, you know, cover insurance cover when you sold hi fi's or tellies or anything else. Um, and I, I couldn't possibly suggest because I knew nothing about them, I don't know the detail about them, but they've been they've been pr- it's been problematic that yeah. field, hasn't it, since then? And um, you know, not just in, in that field, but well, the P- idea PPI that, kind of stuff, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, like you know, that, what yeah. you were being offered, the amount of money you were paying, was it um was it worth worth the cash? Um, 
but we got, you know, we sold stacks of it. And we've always pushed to sell stacks of it. And you, every time you sold the highest cover, it's really expensive. Every time you sold the highest cover package, you used to get a five pound voucher for um, Pizza Hut around the corner. And <laughs> five pound back then used to buy you like full on buffet. So that's all we did any, any lunch time. It's really strange that the Scotch like is such, Saint-Tropez. A, such yeah. an unhealthy nation. Well, that's what I said to you. <laughs> Overeating and over drinking. Yeah. <laughs> so what was the full time moving to football then? When did that happen? When I left university, I, I'd i been doing casual work with PA Sports. So I did, I joined them on a full-time basis, got um, an offer of a job from them straight afterwards. Uh, I was there for two and a half years and, and parts of it were really good. I did some I did some great stuff there um, or some really enjoyable stuff. But there wasn't like the day-to-day, the proper day-to-day football reporting or writing of actually getting out to games and getting out to press conferences and doing all the stuff that you you wanted to do and and I was kind of lucky in 2004 because we lived in Leeds at the time we'd we'd moved through to Leeds because PA were based um stones throw from the station I can't remember what the, the exact patch is called but you know where Bridgewater Place is now yeah pretty much there um which great you know like perfect right in the center and then as soon as I moved they moved out to Howden which is like a village out towards Hull it wasn't quite as quite as good but it made it difficult because you weren't very central there it made it difficult to, to get out and actually do proper Football reporting, but job job came up at the Evening Post in Leeds, two thousand and four. She had general foot, like sports writing um, gig, but mostly football, uh, which I happened to get. The sports editor was a guy called Phil Rostron, who died sadly a couple of years ago. He's a great guy, was was Phil, um, and his job interviews involved taking you to TGIs over the road and still making there? you drink. For is it still there? Still yeah, it's there? the the one on uh, just opposite. Yeah, the, just the under, under the flyover. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I haven't driven that way for a little while. Yeah, it's attached um, to a Premier Inn. Yeah, 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 pretty much. Wellington Place. Um, yeah, that's the one. Yeah, yeah. Um, and obviously the Evening Post building was over the road, but it's been demolished now, and it's um, it's a high rise. Um, I say high rise. I mean, it looks like the, well, they've kept the, the tower is still there. The famous tower yeah. is going to come down when they when they finish that. That's corner it. When off, they, they, they finish but it they're all building off. flats and apartments. Yeah. And so his job interview seemed to consist of drink for three hours. And if you got through the other end of it, then you know you were you were fine. <laughs> Thankfully, I've had a hardened uh, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of ready, ready for this. But I don't, I don't remember him asking me any questions. You know about like, what are you like? What do you do? What is well, it? Do you that think you, it? Would you think he was just like sussing you out? Like? He may. I don't know if he'd sussed me out beforehand and and had asked people who who knew me. Um, but he certainly didn't seem particularly bothered in that interview about. You know, digging deep into are you any good? Yeah. Are you worth um, worth paying money? But it was a. I mean, I, I I've always always regretted the lack of experience that I had during the Bates era because I think it's fair to say and we've been criticised for this a lot, but I think it's fair to say that we didn't scrutinise enough um, in that period what was going on. There were periods where we had major major fights with them. You know, oh seven oh eight the administration summer and also latterly when the trust were marching to Ellen Road and, and Bates was about to sell to, to GFH. Um, but in that period, I could definitely have done with being longer in the tooth and, and a bit more schooled in what to do and, and how to handle it all. But at the same time, Leeds were a like, great introduction to it because the week I joined um, the Evening Post was the week of the Krasner takeover. And that season had been total carnage and I'd sort of been following it from a distance, but in a kind of abstract way because you didn't realise you were going to get into it. You were just constantly sitting, thinking everything you read, thinking Leeds look like, like an absolute shambles. Yeah, you know? it's funny as well because you, you cited like 05, 06 as one of the good times for, for Hearts. So just as Leeds are on this absolutely catastrophic downward, almost terminal decline it looks like, you've got a Hearts team that's yeah. doing pretty well. On the yeah, other. although 05, 06 they almost went up Leeds and... I, it's hard to know how different it would have been if they had got promoted because the debts were pretty steep. But I suspect that if they'd been able to, if they'd been able to get their foot solid, solidly lodged in the Premier League at that point, it it might have solved a, a few ills. I don't know. It it felt so it felt so catastrophic the financial position at Leeds that you it, you know was it always going to end in administration? It maybe was. Um, but that was like a, a little little flash in the pan, although. I mean, I, I know people who watched that season 05, 06 and say that from an aesthetic point of view, don't remember a great lot about it. It wasn't great football, I no, don't think. You tell rubbish. me, I, don't, I didn't see a lot of it. But I mean, the, the fact we got close to going up and actually had spent money, cause it was, I mean, this is, this is a whole separate podcast, but for years Bates had been, well, for a couple of years Bates had been telling us how he'd sorted everything out mm-hmm. and we were going to be debt-free and 
X amount of months or we were nearly there and stuff. And then we'd spent money on people like Healy and Creswell and Holston. There was, there was actually quite a lot of attack, attacking talent there. And um, like Sean Derry was there and Sean Gregan. It felt like there was a, a good solid side. And then it felt like failing to go up was a bit like, okay, well, we need they, they, we just need to go into administration now. Yeah, yeah. It's walking into the casino and putting the house deeds on red or black, isn't it? Yeah, it was like, yeah. if this works, fine. If not, um, Astor and Crato are on very good terms with me yeah. from Bates' point of view. They got leaked. Astor and Crato are in the, uh, is it the Panama Papers, the stuff that all got leaked? Uh-huh. Yeah, and I, I just I Googled them just quite by accident the other the other month and um, yeah, there they were. Again, n- nowadays, the, the understanding of accounts and the significance of them and the, the finances in them is, is so much more vast. Um, but the I think it was the accounts for 05, 06 showed pretty clearly that Leeds had lost about, or had debts of about, 35 to, to 40 million, something like that. And at the time, you're looking at it thinking, that sounds like a lot of money, that. And that sounds <laughs> like a that sounds like a pretty major issue, except the club had just been to the playoff final. They weren't kind of given the impression of anything being untoward. Um, whereas now, I think if you have, if there are things that are ringing alarm bells, people are far more inclined to look and ask questions and say, actually, is this, is this all right? You know, I, I don't know. It just, I, it it was, it struck me at the time as weird how they bounced from the playoff final to administration a year later. But I think the reason it struck me as strange was because of my naivety about what was actually going on and what the picture was. You know, the picture that had been painted, what it really said. So yeah, towards the back of the uh, back end of the Kinnear interview, when we were talking about the way that Leeds fans have kind of reacted and have been shaped by this whole experience. You know, you look back to that as your time becoming a reporter about Leeds United. And in many ways, it's still going on, isn't it? We're only just now, I think, and do you agree with me, still emerging from all that time. Yeah. From like the the relegation, the League One years, the the passing of ownership from person to person to person. Yeah. All this time, you can, you can draw a line through it is what I'm saying. Like you can trace it from point A to now. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know if this summer will come to look like a bit of a lane in the sand for that because you have... You have new ownership, which Leeds have had previously, but it also feels as if a huge amount of what went on in the past, like 15 to 20 years, the people who were involved, a lot of that is now gone. And it feels like, a, it does feel like a different landscape, I think. Um, but it's it, it's entirely um, dictated the way in which Leeds have been viewed in the 21st century. they just been this kind of perennial car crash where people almost look to. Now, it's the it's the chant isn't it about leads are falling apart like that that's that's kind of what is expected in these parts because that's what leads have been doing for so long um but i think what the what was seen during the bielsa era was that th- even if there's a bit of gallows humor and dark humor around here about these things that happen and the, and the various shambles people don't actually want that people do want to move into a bit of calm bit of stability um it would be it would be good and it would be overdue. It's tiring, isn't it? I yeah. mean, that, that's what the point I, I think I've reached with, with following leads is like I'd just quite like it to stop now. And I've said like in the year or two run up to this, like I just like us to do some normal things, do the obvious things. And it, I think it feels like the transfer activity this summer has been us doing the obvious things for the first time in probably a while. Yeah. And some of it's not exciting. Um and it might not work this season. It might not work next season, but I think I think there's a bit of yeah, it just feels like good sense has gone into what we're yeah. what we're trying to do now, and it's it's long overdue. We just need to start seeing some results from it. But um, it's terribly, terribly addictive, isn't it? The the, it is, the lunacy at Leeds. Is, I mean, because yeah. you're still you're still covering Leeds. I think you, you you must be quite atypical in that regard that you've still stuck with reporting on Leeds for yeah. all these years. Like you know, have you never fancied like the Nationals or doing something else? No, especially I I don't. It's it's not been an active choice to carry on doing it, but it's never been an active choice to get away from it either. I mean, the the whole thing with The Athletic when they offered me the job there was that it was going to be Leeds. So what you were doing and what you knew you were going to carry on doing as opposed to a totally clean slate. I mean, I think the, there has to come a day, doesn't there, where either you need a fresh start or people have read as much of your stuff as they should and they need a fresh voice or they're a bit sick of what it is that, that you do. I think like everything, everything, like it's all, it's all got to have a, a shelf life. But, there's always something else to get your teeth into, always. And that that's Leeds. I mean, I think there are probably quite a lot of clubs where you can feel like you're 
at a bit of a dead end with it. And I think the only period where I probably felt like that a little bit was post-promotion under Grayson. I know they almost got to the playoffs um, the following season, but that year and then the season after where they recruited nothing much during the summer, that was like a massive drift of not, not a lot going on and of, of no no real optimism. But there's always there's always something at Leeds, always, without fail. So back in, in the 80s, did you ever imagine when you were a little kid running around just getting into hearts and stuff that this would be where you were. Well, it's like the uh, it's like the podcast thing. If people were saying to me, in 30 years' time, you'll be getting abused on Twitter. You'd be going, <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> yeah, that sounds fun. Yeah. Um, so, no, not at all. But I have to be honest, like, when I was six, seven, I had absolutely no idea what I was going to do, let alone journalism. I mean, absolutely not. But I do, you know, when, back in the day, I was quite an avid newspaper reader and only the sport. The Scotsman's very good. There's loads of great writing in it. Um so I suppose little things like that do plant seeds. But bottom line is you need to be really lucky. Half the time you just need to be in the right place at the right time. Maybe one day. Get <laughs> <laughs> only hope. Well, cheers, Phil. It's good fun, that. Just um, diving into yeah. little mini Phil's background. Yeah. I say, sorry if that's an area of life you'll never get back, but um, it was your idea. <laughs> it beats the drama of Leeds sometimes, doesn't it? Well, it was the Guardian's idea, I think, anyways, Michael. So. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like we need to come back another day to talk about your, um, about your head being... Um, dug into as well just maybe that's an Andy's Man Club episode or something yeah, to get yeah we can do we, that we need, yeah. we need to get more the Guardian ones always make you cry in the end so I feel like we've yeah. uh, we probably need to get into that Imagine if, we, if we carry on talking about Hearts and Leeds we might end up yeah, in tears I'll, I'll bring some video footage apparently there is video footage of the op which does exist somewhere oh, really imagine that Oh, I get a few views <laughs> right well we'll wrap it up there uh, for this one cheers Phil thank you I'll see you in a bit The Square Ball Podcast 